and start our new series today called Made to Worship. And in this series, um, we really want to look at what it means to worship well. You know, um, when you think of religion or faith of whatever kind worldwide, one of the first things you connect with that is worship. You ask the question like, how do they worship? What do they worship? Who do they worship? Those sort of questions come to mind really quickly because we know that with religion, with faith, comes this act of worship. And whether you're talking about um, Hindu prayer wheels or tribal dancing to the gods or Muslims and their call to prayer or Buddhist monks and their meditation, worship goes hand in hand with what it means to have faith in something or someone, whatever that may be. And, you know, as Christians, it's no different, right? We, uh, we have our faith, and with that comes this, this very clear understanding of worship that because of our faith, through our faith, our faith defines for us what worship looks like for us. And so this series, we want to really dig into what that looks like. And, you know, even locally as this church, one of the um, parts of our pathway, our disciple-making pathway is work to worship. That means we want all of us to be participating in worship, both corporately and individually, living lives of worship. And so we really want to spend the next, it's going to be eight weeks, it's six sermons over eight weeks, to look at what is worship. And, um, you know, when we come and think about what it means to worship, every one of us have a background um, that, that informs and colors how we view worship. And some of those may be really good things and some of them uh, more negative, right? But we all have a background we bring with us that sort of colors and shades for us our at least initial thoughts of what worship is, what it looks like. Maybe when I say worship, you immediately think of worship services such as this one, right? Or maybe you think of more an individual experience. Maybe um, you think of music. Maybe you don't think of music. Maybe you you think of some other activity that you associate more closely with worship. Um, Maybe you have a liturgical background, um, you know, readings and responses and that sort of background. And so immediately your mind goes to those kind of thoughts. Maybe you don't have that background at all. And so that isn't at all what comes to your mind. And, And in fact, some of these things, like when they come to your mind, there may be positive memories and some of them may be very negative memories that you associate with that. If you um, didn't grow up in a church culture, you may come with the idea of worship with more questions than assumptions, right? Or maybe just things you've heard about church, these sort of distant secondary influences, but you yourself haven't really had a lot of influences. And so you, you kind of are, are maybe curious of what it really looks like. Um, maybe if you grew up in a different culture, a different um, place in the world with different um, kind of cultural values, then worship looks different from what you see here today. And it may still be Christian worship, but just in a much different context, in a much different way. Um, I personally, I grew up in a church that um, had a big pipe organ right here, okay? And over here was a choir loft that had like, you know, 15 to 20 folks in it every Sunday that, that helped lead us in worship. Over here was a bell choir loft where um, a bell choir every you know, few weeks or a couple months would play. Um, we had um, two uh, of the pulpits. One was the big fat one, and one was the little skinny one. You know, And certain things were read from certain pulpits with the big chairs in the back, right? And in the middle was a big altar with candles and different things and this big, huge Bible that never turned the page but was always there. <laughs> Right? That's, that's my background. So when I, when I think of worship, immediately that's where my mind goes to because that was my experience for the first 18 years of my life. Right Now, with that said, I have to tell you that that isn't where my heart draws to. Okay, That was my experience, but when I actually think of worship, my heart actually draws towards a more um, kind of individual time with God. Now, I love corporate settings, um, whether it's, you know, church like this with you all. I, I, I love that. I've had some fantastic experiences with that. Um, I do occasionally like to hear a good pipe organ blaring, the power of, of whatever it plays, right? 
Um, I enjoy like the liturgical readings times. I, I know their place. And, and so when I experience them today, I can, I can find the value in them. But that isn't where my heart is drawn. The introvert in me loves to have it just be me and God. And so for me, when I think of worship, those sort of things are swirling in my brain, but my heart gravitates towards this one direction. Now, just for the record, I'm not saying any of those other things are bad, okay? I don't want to come off as that way, because if that has been your experience and it's been a great experience for you, I'm glad. I'm glad that that is how you worship. I'm glad that those sort of experiences really connect you with God. I'm just giving you my experience and my, uh, my kind of interaction with this idea of worship because I know that every one of us have these, these different backgrounds, these different experiences, and, and they influence us in different ways. Some of them are very helpful, and some of them um, are maybe not so helpful. Some of them um, have been correct and some may be incorrect. Some have helped us to um, define worship really well and to engage in worship really well. And some of them have actually maybe given us this very small sliver of what worship is. And it's caused us to focus so hard there that we've missed everything else that is also worship. Other styles, other ways, other settings. What I, what I think we will discover in this series is that worship is probably much larger, much more beautiful, much more rich, much more diverse than we think it is, than maybe many of even our experiences have been, that most of our, our experiences throughout our life and, and just the way we maybe travel or lived or, or different faiths that we've been a part of in terms of churches and denominations and such, that we just have this, this little picture and that we'll see that worship is actually much larger. Um, in this series, just to kind of give you a heads up, I'm going to um, intentionally not focus on some of the nuts and bolts of worship, um, the styles, the settings, those sort of things. I, I don't at all want to kind of dig into some of the typical controversies that come up with this topic. So I'm going to completely steer clear of those on purpose, okay? Not because I'm trying to avoid them, but because I don't think they help us. I want us to, to look at the foundations of what it means to worship, what God, the picture that he gives us for worship, the, the, um, the ways that he, he lays out for worship to, to be and to look, knowing that if we have this sort of theology of worship, this foundation built, that now each of us can take our preferences, our experiences, all those sort of things that we all bring with us, and we can build a more robust picture, a more meaningful picture for us of what worship is. Okay, so um, if you're expecting like that, that sermon at some point of this and that and whatever, it's just not going to happen. You know, it's interesting, <clears throat> the Westminster Catechism was written in the 1600s, and its purpose was to be a tool for disciplers to disciple um, younger or new believers. And it has a whole series of questions, and every question then has an answer that's, that's given as well. And it's meant to have this sort of question-answer response that then creates a discussion around the, the question and the answer. And so the very first question of the Westminster Catechism is, what is the chief and highest end of mankind? That's the first question. And the answer to it is that the, the, the man's chief and highest end is to glorify God and fully enjoy him forever. You feel that this idea of worship in that, that our, our purpose, our end, our, our, the reason we exist, according to that catechism, is to worship God forever. Um, John Calvin says, this is a quote, that we should consider it the great end of our existence to be found um, numbered among the worshipers of God. There's this clear view in Christendom that our existence, that God put us here in Genesis 1 for the purpose of worshiping him, of, of living with him, of being in unity with him, of, of having that relationship that therefore yields our worship, our glorifying, our uplifting of him in our lives. But there's a challenge to this. There's actually lots of challenges because lots of things in our world get in the way of us worshiping well. Things like <clears throat> distractions or busyness, the world's influences, our own brokenness, <clears throat> false or distorted theologies that twist things for us. 
our own self-centeredness, our own desire to just have our preferences and not be focused on God, but be focused on ourselves. Suffering, our, our feelings. Sometimes we just don't feel like worshiping. It's been a crummy day or whatever, right? And our feelings get in the way. Sometimes we struggle to connect Sunday morning with Monday morning. That we come to a place like this and we have this expectation of worship and so we're kind of ready to go. And then tomorrow morning we're like, work, don't feel like worshiping today, right? And we struggle to connect these parts of our life and how worship goes through all of them. Things such as the urgent and the important, that the urgent always seems to crowd out important things like worshiping. And so we have these challenges, these barricades or, or barriers that come up in front of us that, that even, if we, even if we have a desire to worship, we struggle to worship well because of these things are, are coming up against us. And so today we want to start this discussion in John chapter 4, and we're really going to focus on the very foundation of worship, okay, the, the very just beginnings of worship. And so if you'd like to turn with me to John chapter 4, that's where we're going to be. If you brought your Bible, that's fantastic. I'd encourage you to bring a Bible every week. We're going to use it, I promise. And so I would just bring it with you. If you have crayons and you want to like take notes in the, in the margins, do it, right? Or you can use a pencil, either one, right? But we're going to use our Bibles. Um, if you don't have a Bible, there's some in the seats under, um, like in front of you, or in our campuses, there's some in the back. Um, we're going to have it on the screen here too, but just Bibles are standard equipment when we come to church. And so I would encourage you to bring them with you. So we're in John chapter 4. <clears throat> we're going to start in verse 4. This is a famous story. Many of you have probably heard or know about the woman at the well. But I, we miss, when we just define the story as the woman at the well, we miss the point. And the point is actually worship. And so we're going to read this, this story together and, and see what Jesus tells us about worship through this story. So I'm starting in verse 4. <clears throat> he had to pass through Samaria. And now he came to a Samaritan town called Sychar, near the plot of land that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And so Jesus, since he was tired from the journey, sat right down beside the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me some water to drink. For his disciples had gone off into the town to buy supplies. So the Samaritan woman said to him, How can you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for water to drink? For Jews use nothing in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you had known the gift of God and who it is who said to you, Give me some water to drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said to him, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where is it that you get this living water that you speak of? Surely you're not greater than our ancestor Jacob, are you? For he gave us this well and drank from it himself, along with his sons and his livestock. Jesus replied, everyone who drinks some of this water will be thirsty again, but Whoever drinks some of the water that I will give will never be thirsty again. But the water that I give will become in him a fountain of water, springing up to eternal life. I'm going to stop there for a moment because we've read a lot and a lot has happened in this story already. And I just want to let you know there's a lot happening kind of under the surface of this story culturally that just isn't our focus today. So I'm going to kind of let it set for, for now and it would be a great story that we need to come back to someday and really dig into culturally what's happening here. But it's interesting that it says in the very first sentence that he had to pass through Samaria. That's actually not true, by the way. He could have easily gone around, and most Jews would have gone around. Most Jews would have completely avoided Samaria. I think he had to go through because he knew the mission. He knew God's call. He knew God's purpose, and he knew that to be obedient, he had to go through, even though he didn't 
logistically have to. Because see, we talked a couple of weeks ago, if you remember the story of the Good Samaritan, we talked about the Samaritan people. And you might remember that they were Jewish people that several hundred years previous had intermarried with Gentiles. And so because of that intermarrying, the, the pure Jewish people rejected them and pushed them away because they looked at them as traitors, that they had compromised their Jewishness, that they had somehow like um, um, sacrificed this holiness that God had given them as God's holy people. And so they had been pushed away and segregated away from the Jewish people. And so this area is called Samaria because this is where they they lived, where they'd been kind of exiled to, oppressed out of the, the normal Jewish flow of life to allow these people who had compromised to be put over here so we don't have to interact with them. And so that's shading this whole conversation to even where you notice she says, like, you, a Jew, would drink from the same thing I'm drinking of, a Samaritan. Like, this is a cultural thing that they, she just can't compute. Why are you, Mr. Jewish man, even having this conversation with me? Why are you here? You shouldn't be here. And so there's all these kind of cultural things, this prejudice and such that's underlying this interaction. And it's, inter- it's interesting, though, that this interaction begins with Jesus asking her for a drink. And it ends with the situation being turned where he is offering her a drink that she didn't even know she needed. You notice that? that he says, if, if you would know who was asking, you would actually be asking me for a drink. And the water I have is different than this water. And she, she very quickly goes to Jacob. You can tell that she has that Jewish background that she has, even though she's been pushed away from Jewish society, she has that influence in her life. And she immediately takes the conversation back to Jacob. And she's like, who do you think you are? Do you realize this is Jacob's well? Do you, you know Jacob, right? The father of all Israel. And, and he, he's the one who dug this well. And so somehow you're saying this water you have is better than this water. The water founded, dug, created by Jacob, the father of the Jewish people. And Jesus says, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Because, see, he he is offering her a gift, a gift of living water. And she doesn't understand it yet. She's still trying to compute it. She's still trying to put the pieces together, but he knows exactly what he's doing. She put the pieces together with him and Jacob as a way of questioning and comparing what he is saying to what she believes to be true. He knows all the backstory that's underlying that exact comparison that she hasn't put quite put together yet. See, he knows that in the Garden of Eden that it was a place of life and that there was this spring pouring forth from it that was the water of life and it was God's very life being brought into the world. And that when Adam and Eve rebelled against God and were exiled from the garden, they lost access to the garden but also access to the water of life causing all of humanity to be thirstier than they ever imagined they could be for life, for God himself. Because that relationship was torn apart by their sin. And so then you take that theme and you trace it further into the story and you get to Jacob. And here he is at this well and he meets a woman at this well, a woman who would become his wife and become the mother of his children And they together would create Israel. That's what she was referring back to, the the Israelite people. And here, at this exact same place, this exact well, here is Jesus saying, I am offering the water of life. And he's telling her that no matter how much water you draw out of this well, you'll still be thirsty tomorrow. You'll need to come back for more. But the water that comes from me, from my well, from who I am, you will never be thirsty again. Because he, he's making this clear connection that that he understands that she's trying to figure out between he and the water of life that flowed from the Garden of Eden all the way through Scripture. That he is the embodiment of that. That he is the water of life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. That he is it being poured forth. He is offering her the gift of eternal life in him. Now, she hasn't put that together yet, but that is exactly what he's offering to her. 
The first thing we need to know <clears throat> about worship is that in order to worship, we must start not with giving worship, but with receiving. We must start with receiving, receiving Jesus, receiving our faith in him as the living God, as the water of life. And in all of human history, since Genesis 3, as we've been separated from him, God has sought after us. He has pursued us. He has sought um, to bring us back into relationship with him. He has given us gift after gift after gift after gift to draw us back into relationship with him. And he has given us gifts to, to help us worship well. That As this was broken, as we caused the, our rebellion to come between us, he wants us to be able to come back in relationship to him and worship. And so he has given us those those abilities and then he's he sought after us so that we can worship him well he has done this through leaders through laws through priests through prophets leading all the way up until jesus whom we're seeing here who is presenting himself as the ultimate embodiment and fulfillment of all those things god in flesh the living water pouring out through who he is offering himself as the way of worship. He is the ultimate, the only way of worship. Through Jesus, his perfect life, through his death on the cross, his resurrection and his ascension, all of which we celebrated the last couple of weeks, right? All of which we can be assured once and for all that we can worship God. And we go back to the, the catechism to, um, uh, to uh, what's his name, the other guy I quoted, I can't think of at the moment, that, that it, through Jesus is how we become true worshipers. Through him is how we are able to approach the throne. You know, Romans 6.23, a verse that we all hear quoted often, it says the, the wages of sin is death. But it, you get the second half, it's the, the free gift of of God is eternal life. That, that our salvation and the, the millions of blessings that flow after our salvation are gifts from God. We cannot worship until we first receive. Until we first receive our salvation from him. Jesus has approached this woman and he is offering her a gift that she is trying to figure out. She's trying to understand. What does this guy mean by living water? What is he saying? What is, who does he think he is? I'm sure the question she's asking, what is this gift he is offering? And so in verse 15, the woman says to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty and have to come here and draw water. You can tell she, she's intrigued, right? She's being drawn in, but she still doesn't quite get it. He says to her, go, call your husband and come back here. And the woman replied, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right when you said that, that you have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the man you're living with now, he's not your husband. This you, you said truthfully. And the woman said, sir, I see that you're a prophet. This guy she just met... Guy, she doesn't know from Adam. He doesn't know her from Adam. How did he know? How did he know? See, she's intrigued. She is <clears throat> responding to Jesus' gift. Even though she doesn't quite get it, she's being drawn to him, desiring this water he speaks of, yet in a very Jesus way, right? He takes the conversation and makes it just awkward enough to draw her deeper in. It's so fun when he does that. He's like, go tell your husband. She's like, uh, I'm not married. He's like, yeah, I know. Come a little closer. Come a little closer. See, the fact that Jesus is even having this conversation at all should be encouraging to us. Because here's the thing. Here, here he is. Picture this scene. <clears throat> here is a, a woman that in and of itself was a cultural anomaly. A woman who is part of a rejected people group, who is living an immoral life by anyone's standards, either group's standards, in an obscure village, in an obscure place that nobody cares about and wants to go to. 
And yet here Jesus is, drawing her in, offering her this gift. See, you and I need to take away from this, this idea that Jesus is not just seeking after the popular, the significant, the successful, the powerful, the wealthy, the cool kids when he seeks after us. He seeks after everybody. And so if you're sitting here and you're thinking, I'm not one of the cool kids, congratulations. God's seeking after you. He, he seeks after all of us. There is nobody, whether it's because of your background, where you live, what you've done, who you are, any of that, it doesn't matter. It doesn't disqualify you from him loving you and seeking after you and pursuing you. This is so important to him that here he is in his just utter graciousness, welcoming everybody in as worshipers, inviting everybody to receive this gift, this gift of the gospel. See, <clears throat> we can only worship when we first received, but then the next thing, the next step, is that out of our response to that gift, now we respond by worshiping. We return back to him worship. He has gifted us a million blessings, first of which is salvation, and we return back to him wholehearted worship. See, our worship pours out of all of this that we receive. From starting with salvation, going to our relationship with him, going to the, the million other blessings that he gives to the Holy Spirit and dwelling us to our opportunity to know him. You understand how unique that is in the world, right? That we worship a God who desires to be known and allows us to know him. Most religions in the world, their God is dead and has no interest in knowing you. He just wants you to worship him. How beautiful is that? What a blessing that we receive that gift from him that then the natural response would be to worship, to return back worship. And as Jesus is revealing all this to her and drawing her in, he uses this, uh, this and she recognizes that he is more than just the average Joe. You're a prophet. You, you knew something you shouldn't know. And she's intrigued and she is drawn in. And so, I picture her in this moment trying to figure out what is the appropriate response to this strange man, to this offer of living water. What, what am I to do with this? Verse 20. She says, our fathers worshiped on this mountain and you people, meaning you Jewish people, say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus said to her, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You people worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. Now, I, I find some really unfortunate irony in this. That here, the gift of living water has been extended. Worship has been introduced into the conversation. And the first response the woman has is controversy. We've perfected this over the last 2,000 years, haven't we? Controversy about worship. This is really unfortunate, but we have found 15,000 different ways to argue about worship. And I think we're going to see here in the, the next couple sentences, Jesus makes it really clear what worship is. I think this is really important for us because she, she brings up this controversy about location that <clears throat> according to the Samaritan people, Mount Gerizim is where worship should be done. That's the proper place. And according to the Jewish tradition, it's in Jerusalem at the temple. They're like, well, which is it? What's the right way? And of course, each side would have their argument for theirs, right? Just like every good controversy. Because if you didn't, it wouldn't be a controversy. Right? And so here she brings this up, and I love his question. His question is, or his, his response, I mean, is very simple. He's like, look, your question is irrelevant. The controversy doesn't matter. 
Because the time will come, and the time is today, that location doesn't matter. That it's about something other than location. And so then he, he continues on. He continues on in verse 23. <clears throat> he says, but in time, a time is coming, and, and it's now, by the way, it's right now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such people to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and the people who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. She's connecting dots, right? The one called Christ. Whenever he comes, he will tell us everything. Jesus says to her, I'm the one. I, I, the one speaking to you, am he. See, she, she has with her background, she's putting these pieces together as the conversation is happening. And she knows she's looking forward to Messiah, to the, the hope of the coming Messiah. And she's like, yeah, when he comes, you're right. All of the location stuff won't matter when, when he gets here. And Jesus goes, that's me. That's me. But notice how he's very clear in verse 23 about what worship is, what proper worship worship is. He says it, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. See, Jesus is being very clear by pointing to himself as the Messiah, as saying that he is our means and our method and our style of worship. That whatever arguments about those things we want to have, they are irrelevant. The location doesn't matter. The style doesn't matter. It is he that matters. He is the Messiah. He is the means, the method, and the style of our worship. Where he is, worship is. Where he isn't, where we try to worship in other ways, through other means, to worship other gods or in other ways, we are not worshiping. Where he is, worship him is. Through him, all worship is that in spirit and truth is acceptable worship. See, true worshipers are those who worship the Father in spirit and in truth. D.A. Carson says we must worship through God by means of Christ. He is how we worship. And he is the one that as we place our faith in him, as we trust him, we receive the Holy Spirit that allows us to then be guided by the Spirit in worshiping him in truth, which is revealed to us in many ways, but specifically God's word. Worship springs from God's Spirit within us, aligning us with the truth of of God's word. The Spirit can lead us to worship in a million different ways. But all of them will be connected to truth. No one worships outside of Jesus. He is the way, the truth, the life. No one worships led by the Spirit apart from the truth. That's not how the Spirit works. And at the same time, no one worships in truth apart from the Spirit because he can't pull the two apart. The two come together. These these boundaries Jesus has drawn here are super clear. Spirit and truth. Yet, for all of us who have worship preferences, and by the way, that's you and me, we also have to admit that as clear as those boundaries are, they are really wide, aren't they? That there's a bajillion ways to worship Jesus in spirit and truth. And odds are that all of us who have our preferences, we have narrowed that spectrum significantly to define things that that may very well be within this, this boundary, but let's be careful that we don't exclude things that are also inside the boundary. That we can see the beauty and the richness of what worship looks like in ways that are maybe not how we prefer. And we can appreciate that. And maybe even in moments when we're, we're in those situations where worship is, is happening in a way that is outside of our preference, but inside the boundary, we still find a way to worship. Because that is what's happening at that moment. The worship happens through Jesus, by the Spirit and by truth. Jesus came 
to make this woman a true worshiper. And her story, although different from your and my story, is the same story. It's the same story of someone far away from God, someone who didn't know him, someone who, because they had not received a gift yet, could not worship yet, and yet the gift was extended. In, in spite of the brokenness and the baggage and the hurt and the preferences and the assumptions that this woman had, the gift was being extended so that as she accepted the gift, then in spirit and truth she could worship. Every one of us have been drawn to him by his grace with this just beautiful gift being extended to us. We cannot worship until we receive it. Now, <clears throat> there's something interesting. As we talk about worship here over the next several weeks, that in the Old Testament particularly, there, there's no one word that's used for worship. When we talk about what is worship, it's not as simple as going to your, your Bible dictionary, looking up the word worship, and then like using every passage that you find. Because worship is described with a number of different terms that God uses to give us this very beautiful picture of what worship is in spirit and in truth that is more than any of the one things we may picture or think of when we worship. And so over the course of the series, we're going to learn some Hebrew. Is that okay? And if you were around on Good Friday, you learned, you cheated already. You learned one of our words for today. Okay? So let's see what we learn about what worship looks like through our two words for the day, okay? Our first word is the word yada. Okay? Now, I don't speak Hebrew. I just act like it. I, okay? Yada. You see it there? Okay? This word means to revere or to worship with extended hands, okay? It's like this physical action of extending hands to raise hands in praise and excitement for who God is. This is yada, yada, okay? Psalm 44.8 says, we will boast all day long and we will continually give thanks in your name. Boast, yada. Like boasting, I'm excited, Psalm 28, 2, hear my plea for mercy when I cry out to you for help. When I lift my hands towards your holy temple. That wasn't transferred worship, but that's what he's doing. He's lifting his hands, saying, God, I'm excited about who you are. This is me worshiping you. Lifting hands. Our second word, this is the one that we talked about on Good Friday. Hallel, you remember that one, those of you that were here? It's the root word of the word Hallelujah. Hallel is to boast, to rave, to shine, to celebrate, to lay aside inhibitions, an exuberant expression of celebration, praising him with abandon, singing and dancing. That's really uncomfortable, isn't it? That's what Hallel is. It's this idea of like overwhelming, like I can't control it, I'm celebrating God. Psalm 22, 22 says, I will declare your name to my countrymen. In the middle of the assembly, I will praise you. You picture a group of people, and there you are in the middle of it, praising and elevating who he is. Psalm 69, 30, I will sing praises to your name. I will magnify him and give thanks. See, my, my understanding of this is that these two words, and we'll get to more later, are ways we respond are ways that once we understand this gift, once we receive the gift, once we, we understand who he is, we get to know him more, our relationship with him grows as that continues and we, we kind of get it more and more and more that we can't help but respond, that we would yada and we would halal and that our hearts would just be overflowing with worship in a number of different ways. And some of these Hebrew words as we go through these eight weeks are going to surprise you, by the way on what it is that Scripture tells us is worship, is how we return back to him. Worship for what he's given in his gift. And so let's review real quick. We cannot worship until we receive. So I start with this question today. Have you received Jesus? Have you received that, that first gift, the gift of faith? What else have you, have you received from him? 
Sometimes it's hard for us to receive from God because we'd rather earn it, but that's not how it works with God. Have you received from him? My prayer today is that whether you're first time receiving or whether you just need to be reminded of all that you've received, that today there would be this freshness in the gift that God has given. And that then, once we, once we receive, that we would return worship to him. We are, our lives would just overflow with worship because we know what we have received. And this is where we start worship, is receiving and returning back to him. Would you pray with me, please? Father, um, you know, we're just coming off of Easter, and God, I pray that, that each of us um, took, took time over these weeks to, to really understand, God, what it is that you've done for us, this gift that you have extended. Father, I pray today that if there's anyone who has not received this gift, that they would. That you would, <clears throat> you would draw their hearts to you. That just like this woman, they would, they would be wrestling with your gift of living water. And Father, for those of us who have been following for a while, maybe, maybe things have gotten old and stale. Maybe we've lost sight of these gifts. Father, bring them afresh in our hearts. Wake us up to your million blessings. Father, cause our hearts to return to you in worship. Cause us to, to respond appropriately and to worship you well. Father, as we finish our time here today, we're going to sing, but we're also going to take up an offering. And we do this, this is a very tangible, material way for us to understand this, that we have received material blessings from you and now we give back a small portion. We return them back to you in worship. Father, I pray that our hearts with the offering would not be obligation or guilt, but would be worship. Father, I just, I thank you that we, we can come before you and we can know you and we can worship you and we can respond to you and worship so personally. Just thank you for that. I ask this all in Jesus' name.